Good evening, everybody. My name is Megan Hayes Golding, and welcome to Summer Seminar. Our topic tonight is assessment. We've got um, two guests Jamie Frank teaches ethics here at Deerfield Academy, and Dana Huff teaches English at Worcester Academy, a little about an hour east of us. Uh, so, this is a very Massachusetts heavy presentation tonight. Um, here's what you can expect out of the plan for, for this evening. Um, we'll wrap up at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, in that time, Jamie's going to share first, and she's going to share about low stakes online quizzes that she created in the spring term. Um, it was a really awesome way for her to engage students in amazing discussions in class. Uh, so I think that's a, a really interesting topic you're going to enjoy. Um, it's also worth noting Jamie's classes were new to her students were all new to her in the spring. Uh, so there's also an element of relationship building in there, which I think many of us are are searching for right, right now. After Jamie presents what she did this spring, we're going to go into breakout rooms and talk about what we've seen. And we've got some prompts from Jamie, but also can take the discussion in whatever direction our group wants to. After we come back from those breakout rooms, we'll be around 8.30 Eastern time, and Dana will share about her research on authentic assessment. Um, she's got some guiding questions that we'll be able to take into some breakout room space and, and think about and discuss what, what, uh, how authentic assessment can help us, especially as most of us are looking at, at teaching online this fall. Uh, so maybe a couple of little kind of suggestions for guiding summer seminar tonight, especially if you're new. Uh, the chat window is a space I strongly encourage us to take advantage of. I'll be watching for questions to pass along to our presenters. Um, and uh, I also encourage you, if you hear an idea and you just kind of want to riff on it a little bit, it's a great space and in a way that the in-person version of that would just be rude to turn, you know, maybe turn to somebody and like just start your own conversation. It's totally acceptable here in the chat window. Um, so welcome. We are up to 27, nope, 28 participants. Uh, so Jamie, I'm going to hand it off to you and um, good luck. Thank you. All right. I'm going to share my screen, get that going, and then we'll get started. Can everybody see that okay? Great. So hi, educators, friends. I'm excited to have you all here tonight. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, low stakes quizzes and how I use them this spring when we went online and why I think that they are wonderful. Um, so I teach ethics. I teach ethics um, to ninth and 10th graders. Um, and one of the things that typically happens um, in, a, in a philosophy class is, you know, sometimes you'll like give the kids a cool hypothetical or case study to sort of introduce the idea. And then typically one of the things that happens at least once a unit um, is you'd give kids an excerpted um, kind of dense philosophical reading to read on their own. And then they'd come into class um, as a group and you'd, you'd talk about it and sort of deconstruct the reading together um, and kind of figure out how the philosopher, you know, made his argument and, um, and what the theory is all about. So that's, you know, one of the things that, that very often happened in my class. And it became clear to me really quickly when we were going to go online um, that the way that had happened before was going to be nearly impossible to do, to do well. Um, so I had, I had to make some shifts in how I was thinking about this. Um, one, this, this is my shift to online. This is how I felt about that whole situation. <laughs> Um, so some of the um, some of the shifts I, I realized I sort of had to make. Um, one was something that I think I've I'd been sort of doing a little more of every year anyway, which was like de-emphasizing the content of the you know the sort of nuances of all these philosophies, and shifting really more towards meaning making. Like how do we promote critical introspection, and how do we promote like application and connection. Um, so I really wanted to shift the focus um, towards that a little more. And then the other shift in sort of teaching was um, being able to sort of read the, the room, at which at least I sort of felt like I was, was doing to sort of see like, all right, are they getting it? Like, who's not getting it? Is nobody getting it? And, um, you know, where, where are the confusion points? Um, 
which I felt at least like I could sort of do from being in a conversation with kids because somebody would look at you like you were crazy and somebody wouldn't be looking at you at all. And of course online, like they're all looking like <laughs> at you like you're crazy or or nobody's looking at you. So um, so I had to really shift that that um, way of getting information about how the kids were, were taking this. And um, in an earlier summer session, somebody described it as replacing my senses. And I thought that was a really good framing um, for sort of how, what I had to do. So, so I wanted to know when they came into the like synchronous classroom online, what holes there were in their understanding of the content. So that was my goal. I wanted to, when they came in the room, I wanted to know what what holes there were in their understanding. Um, and so the way I decided to do that was through these low stakes quizzes. Um, and you can see, um, so this is an example of my Canvas page um, that I, of where I would do, where I would do this. So either I would give them a short reading or a couple, a video or a couple videos, and then they would have this, um, this low stakes quiz that they would take on Canvas. And we were pass fail anyway, but I, but I would have, had we been graded, I would have also made it clear that this was not part of how the content of their answers wasn't how they were being assessed. It was like just they needed to do it, they needed to as part of their homework, but the quizzes themselves, they weren't being assessed on whether they got the answers right. It was really more for us as a class and for me as their teacher to know like where the holes were in their understanding. Um, so this is kind of what it would look like for them. They would take the quiz and I'm gonna now take you to an example of what this looks like to show you why this was wonderful and even better than I thought it would be. Can everybody see this, this page, student six? Yeah, good, okay. So the way I would set this up um, is I would ask, I would ask a, a question and the way I did it was I, I would do these open-ended questions and then they would give these sort of open-ended answers. Um, you can on Canvas and I think probably other learning management systems to automate it. So if it's like a multiple choice or yes, no, there is that option. But for my class, it worked better to do these open-ended questions. Um, and then I would respond to their questions with like either, yep, that you got it or like, yep, and here's this nuance that you like might have missed. So like this is this this first one's an example of that. Um, and it was really helpful in in achieving the goal that I had for these of understanding where the gaps were in their understanding of the of the content before they got to class. So for example, um, this particular question, like none of them got this right. And it's because the video didn't explain it well. And so I knew that if I wanted them to have this piece of the theory, we were gonna have to spend some time in class like covering it. Um, so it met that goal, right, of like having the content, knowing what the content was um, that, they were, that they were missing. But it also did these other things that I thought were really super helpful. One was because I think, I think because it was low stakes, the kids seem to have like fun with this. So like they would write these funny things in their answers that were also correct. <laughs> so it was great because they just seem to be like engaging with it on this um, level that, you know, made it personal and made it fun and funny. And um, so that was like a real joy to see them engaging with it on that level. And then the other piece was, I would always ask at the end of the quiz, what questions do you have about this concept? Um, and that did a couple things. One was sometimes they actually had like a, a content question about it that I could then address in class or, or in, in, the, in my comment back. Um, it helped me sort of with the metacognitive piece of like, if they don't get it, do they know they don't get it? Or are they like, yep, I got it. Like that part was helpful for me too, to know what they got, what they, what they knew they knew. Um, and then the other piece that was wonderful was um, they would like pose interesting hypotheticals here. They would ask questions about the lives of these philosophers. They would, they just, they displayed, humor and creativity and um, curiosity in a way that was really exciting. And I think part of that was because it was low stakes, they sort of felt like they, they had this opportunity to kind of make it their own. Um, so I'm a huge convert on these. I, you know, um, if, um, when, when, let's go with when, when, when we get back to in-person teaching, um, I'm going to absolutely keep these as part of my practice because I found them so helpful in all these sort of unexpected ways. Um, 
so so those are my takeaways from this they you know they they did achieve the goal of helping me see where the holes were i think it helped the content gel in the kids mind this this week at Deerfield we've been taught we've had some um professional development about how taking quizzes like this can help like encode the information in the kids minds which is I think another benefit and then and then it just let the kids engage with the material um in this really authentic um way that that had wonderful results um so that's why I really love that's why I love low stakes quizzes um so my discussion questions are really around sort of things that I've been thinking about as I think about sort of how to make this better. Um, and the, the general direction is sort of, you know, what are benefits I might not be thinking about? What are limitations? You know, how might you use this in your class? If you use it, like, how could you make it better? One thing I was thinking of is like, I would spend all this time writing comments back to them about their quizzes, like, and, but I didn't, I didn't, hold them accountable really for reading my responses and how, you know, what's a way that we could do that. Um, and then the other piece is sort of how might this approach promote inclusion? Are there blind spots where this could actually damage inclusion? I felt like as a teacher, um, I, could, I could really see how it would promote inclusion because you know, in a room where I think everybody's getting it, like now I know, right? If there's a kid who's really not, like I don't have to wait for the summative assessment to know that. I, I knew when they came in the class. So I felt like it really helped me um, know where every kid was and, and meet them where they were. Um, but I but I think that there's probably other opportunities there and other blind spots there. So those are some of the questions I'm thinking about when I think about low stakes quizzes. Um, and that I sort of suggest for the chat room, but I think just generally like, have you used these? How have you used them? Are they helpful for you? Um, are questions I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, so Megan, if you want to pop people into breakout rooms, that's, that's the... This is where you see a look of panic on my face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, I'll stop my share. Will that help? <laughs> Thank you so much. That, that was fascinating and wonderful. As you were finishing up, I was getting breakout rooms set up, but I can't find them in the interface. <laughs> which is weird because this is the same meeting instance that I've used all summer long. Bear with me for about 20 more seconds, folks. No problem. Um, we're not a huge group. I think we can chat here. It's not ideal. Sorry, everybody. You're getting a look behind the curtain here. Okay. Um, we're just gonna, we're gonna chat whole group. I think um, maybe as a protocol, what I might suggest, um, Jamie, could oh, actually, I have the questions here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put our first question in the chat window, everybody. Question one, boom. And just to make it a little more readable, I'm spreading them out. Um, sorry, folks, this will not take me long. Maybe what I'm gonna encourage here as a protocol is let's start with just a little kind of quiet think time. I'll give us about 45 seconds to a minute just to kind of read the questions, think about them for a minute. And then, and then we'll just use, um, you know, turn on your mic or use the chat window to discuss. I'm so sorry about this. Great. I'm gonna give you 30, 45 seconds to, to look at and read. Okay, so we've had a little time to look at and consider these questions. And I wonder if, um, please feel free to go at it in the, in the chat window. Um, but would anybody, um, 
feel free to just turn on your mic and get us started with some conversation. Well, I, I encourage us, let's start in the question one vicinity. And Jamie, I'm gonna let you kind of moderate the discussion if you would. Yeah. Hey, I'll speak up. My name's Jan. <laughs> I'm a teacher at Deerfield Academy. I just, if Megan, I'm sorry, I was ready to say something about question three, if that's okay. Um, yeah, and with me. <laughs> I just was going to say that, especially at the beginning of a school year when we don't know our students well, this might help us to understand how, um, how well students read, how they prepare. You know, it might give us evidence that some students are a little further along in terms of their preparation for the standards that we have or the way we expect them to prepare for class. You know, and I, I just think in those early days, and maybe it's early every term or what, but, uh, but I, I do think that we might be able to get some clues on what they're doing each afternoon or evening, whatever it may be, as they look ahead to the next day by having these non-graded low pressure assessments. I suspect mm -hmm. it's pretty beneficial in that way. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jenna. Thank you, Jamie. Uh -huh. um, another benefit that I saw, it, some of your comments back to the students reminded me of things I would say out loud to them during like a warm up. So like I, I always, am, in the online space, I'm missing that kind of those initial interactions. So this enables you to like give them that relationship building piece too, even though it's, you know, in the, in the asynchronous time. Yeah, that's a great point. I, w one of the things that would, I think, be an interesting thing to think about is sort of, like I was a little informal, like you saw, I wrote like LOL. Um, which I did like intentionally because just of that, right? Like I wanted to, like I, this was the first time I was interacting with them. And so to sort of have that space to be like myself and have them feel that connection, but there could be an also argument under other circumstances or other classes or whatever to be like more formal in the responses too. That's a great point. Hi, this is Megan. Um, I feel like one opportunity, and I teach physics, the, the opportunity that comes to mind here for me is some early feedback. I guess it depends on when this is due and when class meets, but potentially some early feedback on, am I going in vaguely the right direction or did I just spend you know an hour of homework doing this all wrong? And if you set up your feedback to, and your due date to be well-timed, that seems really useful. That's a great point. And one of the things that I learned, a mistake that I made was I made them do when class began. And if I was going to do this again, I would have it do like either the night before or like, you know, if you had an afternoon class the morning of or whatever, because inevitably, right, there was that kid and it was always the same kid who would turn it in like one minute before class started. And then I just did, you know, I just didn't have the feedback on him until later, although it was helpful, right, when he was doing poorly in the class, obviously we weren't graded, but like, to be like, hey, you know what might help? Doing it before 129, when the class is at 130, like that was another sort of like metacognitive skill that was like, here's the thought, which, you know, also you can, you know, there's, it's timestamps, so you know when they turn it in. Hi, I'm Pam, and I don't have an answer, but I, I want to focus a little bit on question two because I think one of the biggest challenges with this online environment is having students take the responsibility for reading that feedback because it's such an important component of what we would normally be doing in the classroom and to have it over the distance. I, I want to know what other suggestions people have on how to have students incorporate that into their routine. Hi, Jamie. Uh, I was thinking about your, this, I was thinking about question two as well, um, because I used Canvas quizzes a lot this last spring. Uh, in fact, that was just kids submitted their homework to me every day. And I um, struggled also with the idea that I'm writing all these comments and they're not necessarily reading them. So had I thought through that more carefully, I might have come up with a plan. I did not, but thinking about it now, I was thinking, there's a couple ways to sort of make sure that they're reading them and responding. Like one of the things that you can do is um, in the, a Canvas quiz or uh, assignment, you can 
have them upload a document. And so instead of closing the quiz at a particular time, you can have that, or you can reopen it as well. You can close it and then reopen it again, but then have, have them part of that quiz grade would be, it would be partially graded and then they would read your comments and then upload a short document, a little paragraph that would respond to your commentary would be one way to do it or just create a second assignment, you know, sure. so it's assignment one A and one B and that way they're sort of looking at your comments and then uploading a second sort of response. Um, so a follow up that re that means you have to follow up on it as well to make sure that they've done it. But um, I, I would agree with you that I felt like I was sort of shouting into the wind and not really sure if anyone was listening because I would say things and then the next assignment would have the same kind of errors. So, yeah. yeah. So, but I was also thinking about how exciting it would be to since there's going to be so many more opportunities when I'm going to give them something on video to watch a little yeah. bit of flipping this this when we're online that how great it would be if they watched that video and then provided me with some feedback. So when they walked into class, I would already know what questions they had about the video that they watched. Yeah. So I could be sure that I addressed them when we were together, if that makes sense. So yeah. I was really thinking that was a great idea, that what you were doing was really a great idea to sort of blow stakes and that they're just asking me questions or telling me what's, what's complicated about what they watched. But it was a really cool idea. Thanks. Yeah, and you know, I think um, th th those I like I like those ideas for for the sort of follow up and 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 um, you know sort of where appropriate holding them accountable. And it, it I, I think I just saw something in the chat window come through too of sort of the idea that like maybe it's okay in some instances since they are low stakes that like that they might not read every word and 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 like sort of maybe just sort of like interest based because there were some kids who again surprised me. I'd be like, hey, if you're really interested in this, think, look at this article. And like, lo and behold, I was shocked. Like I just was thrown another be like, all right, like, let's see. And there were kids who would read that article and in class be like, well, I read this article, blah, blah, blah. I was like, what? Like it was crazy. So I do, I do think the um, agency that it gives to have them be low stakes, you know, like lets kids follow their curiosity in any way. Jamie, did you see Prudence's comment at the end here in the chat window? Oh, I don't know if I did. Let's if see. these are low stakes quizzes, is it potentially okay that the kids might also consider the feedback low stakes? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's it. I just think like in some in some senses, right, like that, that might, there might be some instances in which that's the case because I wasn't like quizzing them later on like what are the nuances of, you know, act utilitarianism versus rule utilitarianism. It just, you know, but there were it's, there were also instances where a kid would be like, I just really want to know, and and would sort of follow up on it. So it was, yeah. it, there is there's that agency piece. I would I also no. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Again. No, I was just going to add that like if it, I wonder how long the kids are spending on this. Like I don't know how much energy I would invest in the feedback if the kids are only. I don't know. It depends on what what the purpose is. Um, but if it's a low stakes quiz, I would want a way to signal to the students that if they don't get a five out of five, that maybe there's something there that they're, they need to check their understanding on. And so they need to go in and some, some misinformation has been given. So Jamie, I was just wondering, like, is there a way where you can still keep it low stakes, but also signal to the student that they may have misunderstood something? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. And and um, typically in this like this past in the spring, what I would do is just be like, we're going to talk about this more in class, or or like if it was like one kid who missed it, I would I would write about it in the in the box. But like you said, Prudence, I think that you're right. It does depend on what the like um, summative assessment is going to be, because if they think the summative assessment is going to hold them accountable for the nuances of what they're learning, then like then they're more incentivized to go back and kind of read that. But if it's like if the summative assessment makes like takes the high level idea and and then they sort of use it and they don't need to sort of like have all the details then then they probably would be less inclined to go back and like comb through the comments so you're right i think it depends on a lot on what the what it's leading up to which probably you know is always right like a good idea to be clear about at the beginning so that there's that clarity built in on sort of what you're going to be holding them accountable for that's a great point
I really like Robin's point here in the chat window. Can a low stakes quiz be multiple choice that gives immediate feedback based on what they choose? Canvas absolutely allows that or give like a no stakes quiz. Mm -hmm. um, and we use Canvas. Canvas certainly allows for both of those options. I yeah. think there's even a way in Canvas to make something ungraded, but still have points. I'd have to check in on that. Um, so if you wanted to use points as the way to signal, hey, if you get anything under five, go read my comments. Yeah. It strikes me that kids need to be trained to read feedback in learning management systems. Yeah, I think that's right. And maybe put out one last call for thoughts, comments, questions. Wait time online is so much longer because you have to wait for someone to think of it, then type it, then hit enter. <laughs> All right. Please feel free to continue your thinking in the chat window. But um, Jamie, first of all, thank you so much. That was fascinating. And um, I'm so excited you got to share it with everybody. Um, we're going we're gonna to switch over and I'm going to call Dana up now. And Dana's going to talk about authentic assessment. You are muted, Dana. Mute myself, yeah. <laughs> I do this every time. Um, so as Megan said, yes, uh, my name is Dana Huff and I'm the English department chair at Worcester Academy. And I'm also a doctoral candidate at, at um, Northeastern University. I am researching grading and assessment and Megan can probably tell you this has long been a passion of mine because we've been talking about it for probably about 15 years now. So I'm going to share my screen and sort of walk you through uh, what I want to talk about, um, just so that you have a little bit of a roadmap. I want to start with exactly what the research does say about authentic assessment, but I'm not going to spend as long on that because I, you will have a copy of this presentation, so you don't need to frantically take notes and frantically take screen captures. Um, I, Megan also has a copy if something happens and you have to leave early and you weren't able to get it for some reason. So don't worry about that. But I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about what the research says. But then I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about how you can do some of these things by giving you some examples of things that I've seen my colleagues try, things that I've tried that have worked really well. And we'll end with some discussion just as we did with Jamie's. Uh, presentation. And so just to start um, to run through this sort of quickly, um, my research does focus on proficiency based grading and authentic assessment. Proficiency based grading really means uh, giving students multiple opportunities or maybe multiple entry points to demonstrate their learning. So they might have an opportunity, for example, to revise an essay or do text, test corrections, or they might complete a project um, and the projects would all be different from one another. Um, but basically, uh, proficiency based grading and authentic assessment literature is pretty clear that offering students these multiple opportunities and measuring their learning in different ways including the, the sort of formative assessments that Jamie was talking about are really important and they give you a much better idea of what students have learned. And I have some, uh, some quote or some basic um, nuggets from the literature. Uh, Gusky is a really important um, researcher in assessment. And I really like his comment that, you know, when you offer these multiple measures, you do get a fuller picture of what students have learned and the assessments become more equitable and comprehensive because you have that fuller picture. And also, um, I think one of the issues that I've seen happen with uh, doing all summative, all high stakes, all graded assessments is that it doesn't allow us to identify gaps in understanding. And that's something that Jamie talked about too, that using these assessments is a way to identify where maybe students are having a misunderstanding or where they might be struggling. And projects in particular are a great opportunity to offer students agency and choice in how they demonstrate their learning. 
a little bit more here too. Um, Gusky says it is important to go beyond tests and quizzes and offer students opportunities to do extended writing, create projects, assemble portfolios, and present exhibits of their work. Um, and again, some more uh, data on project-based learning, um, which is effective particularly with students who are considered at risk for failure or from minority populations. And uh, students have also reported that they find that kind of learning to be more engaging. I'll let you look at these, uh, these things in a little bit more detail. Like I said, I'll give you the presentation and I have um, the citations at the end if you wanna go back and read some of these studies on your own. I think they're really um, interesting and worthwhile. Um, this is um, one of my favorite quotes from Grant Wiggins. And um, for those of you who are familiar with Grant Wiggins or may not be familiar with Grant Wiggins, he's one of the writers of Understanding by Design. And he is one of the um, major proponents of what we call backward design in planning learning experiences for students, starting with the end in mind and instructing students in a way to get them to that end point. The point of school is not to get good at school, but to effectively parlay what we learned in school in other learning and in life. Um, I think too often uh, students are not able to make the kind of transfer that Wiggins is talking about here. And oftentimes it's because the assessments we use don't really set them up to be able to make the, the kind of transfer that we'd like to see them do. Um, that's when you start hearing questions like, when am I ever going to use this? Or why do I have to learn this? Or even worse, you start to see students engaging in things like cheating and copying because they really don't understand why uh, the learning that you're asking them to do is relevant. So what I want to talk about is what can we do to help students transfer their learning and what kinds of learning experiences result in transfer. I would argue that if we do three main things, uh, we will see a lot more transfer happening in our classroom. Those three things are offering students more agency in how they demonstrate their learning, giving students opportunities to reflect on their learning and using multiple measures or different kinds of assessments so students have multiple entry points for demonstrating their learning and I would also add to expect students to revise if they don't meet uh, proficiency that first time. So the way I like to think about um, agency is when you're teaching skills like research or writing, the actual topic might not matter, especially if what you're after is trying to teach students how to construct an argument, how to do research. Those kinds of things oftentimes are independent of the topic. So if the topic doesn't matter, I would say why not let cho students choose the topics? Um, one of my colleagues at Worcester Academy teaches anatomy and physiology and she has the students do a year-long project on a long-term physical disability and the students select the topics that they want to focus on based on their own interests and then they make connections to the curriculum in the class and their relationship to their research topic and then they present what they've learned at the end of the year. And our history teachers have a very similar project. They ask students to do a year long uh, project. And um, one, of my, one of the students that I talked to um, told me that she decided she would focus on gender equality through the last century in different parts of the world. And this was in a world history course that all of our ninth graders take. So in both of these, cases, uh, students selected the topics that they wanted to focus on in order to demonstrate the learning and the skills that the teachers were looking for. And I will share, I almost always ask students to choose their essay topics. I very rarely give a, a prompt. I teach AP literature, so sometimes I, you know, when we're doing practices for the AP exam, I will give them a prompt. But I love offering students opportunities to select what they want to write about because then I don't have to read 30 essays on why Brutus is the most honorable character in Julius Caesar. I mean, that gets very old 
very, very, very fast. Um, and I get, I get a little bit of uh, a different, you know, thing each time I, I read a different student's essay. And I find that the students are more invested in the topics because they've chosen them. This is what they said they wanted to investigate and what they wanted to write about. And I've also noticed that they tend to take a few more risks um, with their learning and they also plagiarize a lot less. I've had very, very few cases of plagiarism since I've asked students to start choosing their topics most of the time. And the way that I do this is I have a writing workshop and students need to bring their topic and their thesis if they have it ready to go or if they have it ready to workshop. Um, and we go around the room and everybody shares and we give each other feedback on what we think, how does this sound? Does this sound like something the rest of us all wanna read? So you're, you're building in an authentic audience for the students, which is very important. But you're also showing them that, that the teacher is not the only person who cares about their writing. The rest of the class is invested in hearing what they have to say too. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of multi-genre writing projects, but I've done these before. This is something that um, Tom Romano, um, I don't know if he invented it, but he's the guy they call multi-genre man. I actually think that is his Twitter handle. Um, and basically the, the concept of a multi-genre writing project is students pick a topic of interest and instead of writing a traditional essay that shares what they learned through their research, they actually write in a variety of genres about what they've learned. So I've seen so many different kinds of genres in these projects. I've seen artwork, poetry, journals, letters, advertisements. Um, I actually taught the NASCAR racer Kaz Gralla when he was a student at Worcester Academy in the 10th grade and he did one of these projects for me and he was already racing at the time and he did a project on racing and one of his artifacts was a physics lesson plan. I know Megan loves that. <laughs> so there's some really interesting physics behind um, racing. And I had another student who decided to do her project on Robin Williams. This was right about the time when, right after he had passed away. And she did this amazing poem in two voices. And um, if you were to look at the right hand side of the poem, it was basically like a dialogue uh, between Robin's outer self and, and his inner self. And on the one side, the poem was basically a comedy routine describing a time when he accidentally almost killed himself. And he sort of plays it off like it was like a joke and it was such a good thing that somebody came home and caught me before I really got myself into trouble. But then on the other side were his inner thoughts and how he really was glad that that attempt had been thwarted and it was a real attempt and not an accident. I got chills reading this poem. She asked me to stand up in front of the room and read one of the voices while she did the other. So we went back and forth and it was just an incredible experience. So I definitely advocate for students having an opportunity to share. Um, she actually wrote me a thank you note when she was getting ready to graduate and said this project that she did in my class was her favorite thing that she did in school, her favorite assignment. So I think that was um, really interesting. Um, I also uh, spoke to another student who was a middle school, um, whose middle school English teacher had the students do a 20% passion project. And I don't know how familiar you are with these projects, but basically, I don't think Google does this anymore, but for a while, they were giving their employees 20% time to pursue passion projects, things that they were interested in, particularly, you know, if it was going to be helpful to Google. And he decided to choose the US Navy as his project. Now what his teacher was really trying to get him to learn were research skills, presentation skills, um, skills in putting together um, an, an essay or in an argument. But because he could choose whatever topic, he chose something that he was really fascinated with and he learned a lot. And when I talked to this student, he was a junior and he could recall so much of the information that he had learned from this project as a middle schooler. And he was um, animated as he was telling the story. 
um, another student shared that in her biology class, she also did one of these 20% uh, time projects. And her question was whether or not zombies could really exist. Um, and when she told me about the project, again, the animation was so clear on her face. She actually made plushies of the different pathogens that she was talking about and made a brain jello cake that she cut up during her presentation um, so that she could share with, in a really easy to figure out way um, with her classmates uh, what parts of the brain would be affected. Um, so I linked here and you'll get this presentation, like I said, to a website um, that was created by an English teacher who uses 20% uh, time projects in her class and it will give you some ideas to go on. And finally, I think, you know, this could be a whole presentation in and of itself, but teaching students how to create questions is life changing. Um, the Right Question Institute actually does lots of workshops around teaching students how to do this. And um, I'll share the, the gist of it with you, but really this is a deep dive and it would be something that would definitely be worth your while to take a little bit more time with. Uh, so the teacher shares what's called a question focus. It's a prompt. It can be a picture. It could be a quote. It just can't be a question. And the students have four rules that they have to follow. Uh, they have to ask as many questions as they can, write down um, the questions exactly as they are stated, do not stop to judge, discuss, or answer the questions, and change any statement into a question. So they usually have the most trouble with stopping to discuss them. They get a good question, they want to stop right then and talk about it. But this is really a brainstorming activity and they write down as many questions as they can. And then students have, um, they go through a process of refining their questions by changing closed ended questions to open and open to closed. And that just gives them an opportunity to make their questions better if they need to. And then they share their three most important questions with the entire class. And from there, I usually have the students pick um, a number, it, it, sometimes it's three, sometimes they really, they, they uh, convince me that they need to do more than three, but um, we, we narrow the process down to so that we've got some really good questions. And I do this right before a Socratic seminar or when we're getting ready to write, they get paper ideas um, in this way. Um, I had students read Toni Morrison's The Song of, uh, Song of Solomon and ta Coates's essay, The Case for Reparations, together. And the prompt I gave them was a quote from the character Guitar when he says, uh, everybody wants the life of a black man. So a couple of questions students came up with when we did that was, um, what, how does the tone of the statement reflect society? And what are the definitions of want in this sentence? And what's the significance of them? And I think these are great examples of students thinking critically about the author's purpose and the uh, language also that the authors were using. I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about reflection because I wanna make sure that we have some time to do some of our own. Um, reflection is one of those things that I, I know for me, it's how I figure out exactly what it is that I learned. But I think sometimes we don't give students enough time to reflect or we don't ask them to reflect. And I would argue some of the things that came up in the chat in terms of addressing feedback, if you give students time to reflect or you ask them to reflect on the feedback, I think you'll, you'll find students read it more carefully. Um, so I think it is important to scaffold reflection. I don't think everybody always automatically knows how to do it. Um, but I, I think the questions, what did you learn and how did you learn it are a great entry point for talking about um, reflection. You can ask students to name one thing they found interesting, surprising, informative during the lesson on an exit ticket. You can ask students to reflect on their learning when they're putting a portfolio together. Why did they select that artifact to demonstrate whatever skill it is that you were asking them to demonstrate? Um, I know I've created portfolios for um, my undergrad and graduate programs and they were powerful learning experiences because I really did have to sit and think about what it is that I learned. 
and also figure out what I could share that would showcase that learning in the best way. I remember taking trigonometry in high school and one problem set my teacher gave me to do was to solve a problem in three different ways. And I had to work through the problem each way. And there, there wasn't one way that was any shorter than the other, but I think it would have been really good for us to, for her to have asked us, for example, which method did we prefer and why? Because that would have been a great way to get us to think about how we approach solving problems. Um, so each time I ask students to do a Socratic seminar in my class, they have to create a reflection afterwards. I will share the template with you that I use. It's um, at the end of this presentation. I didn't create it. Um, I borrowed it from Greece, New York school system, and I've been using it for years. I ask them to take their notes home and I ask them to write down the questions that we discussed in the seminar summarize what the discussion was like. Um, and then I want them to identify something that somebody said that they thought was really interesting. It could be um, that they agreed with it, could be they disagreed with it, could be they just didn't think of that before and they thought it was intriguing. Um, and then I ask them to make a connection to something outside of the seminar. Could be prior learning from another class, could be a book that they've read, TV show, um, it could be a personal experience they've had. I've given them a whole list of suggestions, but they can still do something else. Excuse me, something else that that isn't one of the suggestions as well. Um, one student shared in his reflection that he noticed one of the students in the seminar was having trouble making her way into the conversation. So he suggested that maybe um, he would sit by her and sort of help her out and you know if he noticed that she was struggling to get into the conversation he found that something that was easier to do so he sort of became like a coach for her and it wasn't just the next seminar it was every seminar after that that he decided to sit next to her and just sort of help her out if he noticed that she was having a little bit of trouble uh, getting into the conversation i think um you know, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this, but I think it's really important that you're using uh, multiple measures. Uh, keep in mind, not everything needs to be graded. I think what we heard from Jamie is that these quizzes can be low stakes, but in the chat, we talked about what if, what if they were no stakes? You know, what if we were just using them to gauge what students knew, or if we were using them as either entrance or exit tickets? That could be really helpful. Um, I think it will also help increase the validity of your grades if you're using multiple measures and it will um, offer students opportunities to demonstrate their learning through doing revision or test corrections. A lot of times um, students will work really hard to get back what seems like just a few points, but that tells me that not only do they care about their grades because that's a part of it, but they also really want to make sure that they get it right and that they will work until they get it right. I've had students revise their essays multiple times and what I ask them to do is complete um, a re revision request. They send this to me via a Google form and uh, they basically tell me what they liked about their essay and what they did to improve it. So this gives them an opportunity to reflect and think about, well, you know, why do, why do I really want to have my essay revised and and have you look at it again a second time why do i really want feedback on it a second time how do i feel about it now that i've revised it again you know so i think that the reflection is really important there um, and it does actually help uh, create a little bit more equity um, i did want to share these are some books that i highly recommend if this is something that you're looking to do in your classroom uh, Make Just One Change was written by the people at the Right Question Institute, and it teaches you how to use that question focus technique. Grading for equity will give you a lot to think about in terms of what you grade and how you grade. And I think obviously the gold standard um, book that sort of changed my life is Understanding by Design that really teaches you how to design learning experiences that involve authentic assessment for students. Um, these links that you will have um, at the end are also some more resources to look at. Um, they have 
in some cases, lesson plans or just ideas. And I've got a link here to my Socratic seminar reflection template and a template that I use when we're doing the question formulation technique in my class. Um, and finally, if you need to contact me, the contact information will be here at the end. And if you look at this tiny.cc link, that will take you to this Google presentation. Megan also has it as well. Um, so I wanted to find out um, how you think you could see using reflection and agency in particular in your classroom. Maybe that could be our first discussion question, Megan. Awesome, awesome. So Prudence asked a question earlier. I'm not 100% sure if it fits under the agency reflection. Um, I just pasted it in the chat window. I'll give you a mm. moment to read it. Yeah, Prudence, I'm looking at specific skills. And, and students don't all have to do the same prompt if we're looking for specific skills. Um, my subject is very skill-based. English, um, but I think that you could, that there's lots of ways you could do this in other classes and it could still work. Like I, I said, my um, anatomy and physiology um, colleague, definitely, yeah, absolutely, Robin, I've done this in math. I actually had a colleague, he, he's no longer with our school, but he used to do Socratic seminars regularly in math too, where the students would discuss problems and uh, mathematical reasoning and things like that. And it, it was good stuff. You know, the kids really learned a lot. Prudence, I don't, did I answer your question? Yeah, no problem. So how do you, how do you think we might, um, use agency and reflection in our own classes. Is anything bubbling up for you all in terms of ideas about how you might uh, try something like this? Um, Megan suggested adding a reflection to quiz retakes. I actually think if I were going to teach a, um, a class that was more um, objective like math or science, I might have the students actually reflect on, um, you know, wh what happened here with this problem that they missed? Well, why did they think they missed it? Um, you know, that I think that's a really powerful learning experience. I had a colleague who had students use Explain Everything, which is an iPad app. And they um, did quick video tutorials, Khan Academy style, in which they explained the problems that they missed. So they definitely learned it after having to, you know, as you all know, if you have to teach something, you definitely learn it. <laughs> Jamie, I have um, a rubric that um, I, I, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to get on a small, tiny soapbox and say I'm not a huge fan of the AP rubrics, and I'm not a huge fan of the revised AP rubrics either. Um, I think that they are not exactly clear to kids, but I have some really good rubrics that are designed for different types of writing. Narrative writing rubrics, uh, persuasive writing rubrics, literary analysis rubrics. I've used these rubrics for a long time and they, there's not a topic necessarily tied to them. It's all, it's looking for skills like, did I understand the, um, the meaning of the, the piece that I was talking about or the meaning of the argument that I was trying to make? Um, did I develop my ideas well? Did I include like enough evidence and structure the evidence well? How was my organization? What about my writing at the sentence level? Was I using good descriptive language and, and solid sentence structure, varied sentence structure? And finally, um, grammar usage mechanics and following a citation format like MLA. So yeah, they're very, they're, they're not tuned to a particular topic though.
these are great as as uh, Ben said to use before too. What do you, what do you already know about this, and what do you want to learn about this as sort of um, an entry point into a lesson? I think there's a neat opportunity as we head into fall, where many of us are going to be teaching online, that um, that some of the reflection can take place asynchronously for students. You know, they can. Uh, they can film themselves and share it with you. If you're using Canvas as an LMS, there's a really nice built-in, just a direct recording feature that's in there. Um, but if you're not, there's plenty of other video recording tools. And I think there's a neat opportunity. I did this once in the spring where I had kids solve a problem set. And then what I wanted them to submit to me, and I, I produced an answer, a solution guide for them. I, I don't want your problems literally or metaphorically. Uh, <laughs> but then I said, I want you to record, you know, a one to two minute video of you reflecting on what it looked like for you to look at the solution guide and see how you had done. And some of the kids walked me through their solutions anyhow. <laughs> Other kids did a really nice job of saying, oh, I used to think this, now I think this. Mm -hmm. and, and they were beautiful reflections that I once again stumbled into kind of accidentally this spring. I really like Joan's comment here too about giving students opportunities to reflect once a week and being able to choose the way they do it. I think this is huge. Um, do I want to do an audio, a video, or written reflection? Because people will sort of play to their strengths, um, but you're still giving them an opportunity to really think about what they learned, and I think that's key. I think it's one of those things you want to ask students to do a lot. You know, certainly I think it's important to ask them to do anytime you're getting ready to transition to a new thing. All right, what did we learn? You know, what were our takeaways? What was surprising? What was interesting? I'm curious about one thing. I know we're very close to the end here. I'm curious as to if you could think about when you were in school, K-12, what was an assignment that your teacher gave that you still remember to this day and you thought that was really cool, I learned a lot from that, I enjoyed that assignment? I love that, Robin, about using reflection for learning. Oh, design a trip with another person anywhere you like. That's a dream assignment, isn't it? Just have fun. I had one like that too, Megan, where I had to create a travel guide to a country that I was learning about. And this was sort of the sneaky way my teacher had for me to actually just do research on a country. But it, the putting it in the guise of a travel guide made it more fun for me. I did this great project-based assignment in middle school that I had to be a lawyer and we all had different roles in the scenario. And I can still remember that one really well. I just want to take a minute and notice, I'm not saying we need to do away with tests until colleges decide that we're not going to have tests. We got to have tests, but I'm just noticing nobody's saying I took this fabulous test. So I just want to leave that with you to think about, you know, that, that we should be doing a mix of, of different things because this is where we really take a lot of enjoyment out of seeing what the kids create and the kids actually get a lot of enjoyment out of the learning they do for these kinds of assignments. Thank you so much, Dana. You're welcome. It's, it's great to think about how I can, how I can be more creative in my assessing. Um, thank you. Uh, folks, we are at the end of our time tonight. So can I get a round of applause, Zoom style, use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen for Jamie and Dana. Feel free to embellish with some actual applause if you would like. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Well, everybody, I thank you so much for your time tonight at Summer Seminar. Um, keep an eye out on, uh, on Twitter or if you work at Deerfield in the weekly digest for next week's topic and um, have a wonderful week. Jamie and Dana, we'll stick around for a couple of minutes and see if there are any sure. last minute questions. 
Um, yeah, but yeah, thank you all. I hope everybody has a fabulous rest of your night or day, wherever you are. And please reach out if you want to ask me any questions. I've got the slide deck in the chat. Wonderful.